On the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month, 1918, a group of people joined together and signed what they believed was going to be the last treaty ever needed at the end of World War I. We called that day Armistice Day, and we eventually changed the name of Veterans Day to Veterans Day because, of course, as we know now, that was not the war to end all wars. And um, I feel like with all of the uh, emphasis and the commotion of this past week that veterans kind of missed their time. And so we would like not only in this service, but in all the services that are watching, if there's anyone among us, men or women, that have served our country in the armed forces, if you would please stand and allow us to honor you. Anybody here? Thank you very much. Thank you. There was a cosmic shift on Tuesday. My grandbabies moved back home. on November 8th, and if that was all that would have happened, we would celebrate it, I'd show you some pictures, and we'd move on. But there were other things that also accompanied um, our past Tuesday. And um, I wanna just take a moment before we jump into Acts, I want, at the risk of offending some, I wanna step into this moment a little bit with you and remind us, those of us that are in the room that call ourselves Christ followers, remind us of some things that our faith asks of us. First is that the gospel must stay central. The wonderful news that God entered into time and space and took on sin's penalty on mankind's behalf and now offers it through his grace to any who would receive it by faith is called our good news, our gospel. We must not be ashamed of it, but we also must not ever behave in a way that get, takes away our platform to tell of it, to share it. The gospel must stay central to our understanding of our relationship with the world. The Bible must stay authoritative. There are things it asks of us, some things that we don't like, but it remains our authority, our instructions on how to act, how to treat people, how to respond to our government. And it must remain authoritative. 1 Corinthians 9, Paul said this. He said, though I am free and belong to no man, I make myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible to the good news of Jesus. And then a few verses later, he said this, I have, to the, I have become all things to all men so that by all possible means, I might possibly win some. We have to learn that we also must pray for those in authority. 1 Timothy 2 says, I urge then first of all that petitions and prayers and intercessions and thanksgiving be made for everyone, for kings and all those in authority. It's not just some perfunctory prayer that's half-hearted that says, oh, help him, he's obviously gonna need it. <laughs> but an idea of understanding that Petitions, prayers, intercessions, thanksgiving are made on his behalf, on President-elect Trump's behalf and other government officials. Not because you like him, not because you voted for him, but because the scriptures command you to. Can I remind you that Paul is writing to Timothy, a young pastor who's leading a church in Ephesus, a church that he dearly loves, and he's telling those people to pray for Nero. And you, I know some of you, and you're in your typical, you probably are looking for an opportunity to post something right now. You know, that, that's, I think Trump's about like him. No, he's not. Here's a, here's a quote that I found from Scott McKnight. 
He said this in one simple sentence. What Christians want for the nation should first be witnessed as a reality in their local church. I believe this could be one of our finest hours. The Christian message of hope and reconciliation, of forgiveness and kindness, is one that our world desperately needs. Let's make it true among us. And then let's tell others of the hope. This could be an event that is crafted for us. Let's do our best to rise up to that occasion. The only way we'll be better a year from now is if we get better. We decide. We'll love more deeply. We'll speak less quickly. We'll post less quickly. And we'll be kind. So let me pray for us, and then we'll move into the book of Acts. God, thank you for your grace. Thank you for your kindness. We ask that you would use this time to not only remind us of the truths that are true of you that we've already began to sing, but may we see in the book of Acts you're working behind the scenes. How, how distraught they must have been when these words were first being lived out. And yet you worked them in such a tremendously awesome way. Nothing is wasted on you. You are not in, out of control. This world is, is not confusing to you. Help us to be people of faith. Help us to be people of courage. Help us to be people of grace. Open our hearts, our minds to your teaching. In Jesus' name, amen. We are working our way through the book of Acts. We are in Acts 9 together now. We've, you know that because you've been reading Acts 1 through 12 weekly, keeping up. I know the fire's dying. We've only got a few more weeks left because the goal is not that you just learn a few little events that happen in the book. My desire is that you become familiar with the whole book in its context and that you can intellectually and mentally walk your way through how the church was born and how it grew and what happened in it. So if you were up here, you could probably do this, but let me just remind you of some of the things that you've been reading in the book of Acts. We know that Acts... Um, because of how it begins is written by Luke and that it is a, it's the second volume of a two-volume work. The first volume being the Gospel of Luke, which he wrote and said, these are the things that Jesus did up to the time that he was crucified and resurrected. And then this book is what happened afterwards when he was resurrected and then ascended and how his disciples carried on from that point. And we see that in Acts chapter 1, we kind of have this introduction. In chapter 1, it kind of serves as an introduction. And it begins to tell us that Jesus is with his disciples and he says, I want you to, to do something. It's going to be different than you ever imagined. It's not going to be the political structure you're hoping for. I'm going to ask you to be my witnesses and you're going to move into Jerusalem and then Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the world and take this gospel that you have seen and lived and accepted from me. And he begins to do it just in, and he says he makes promises and illusions of a coming Holy Spirit and how that's all going to work out. And then in the next um, 12 chapters we see in two different sections. First, in chapters 1 through 7, we see how they act in Jerusalem. And in chapter 2, we see the church born. And in chapters 3 through 4, we see the church lived out. And the conversation here and the descriptors of what is going on is quite amazing. There's this descriptive language that talks about 
fire and smoke and thunder and tongues of being spoken out that all people can understand. And, and every Jewish mind that would have heard these things would have referenced back to the presence of God in the temple. And, he, and the writer begins to show a contrast of what's happening is that the old system is gone. Jesus has done away with the old system and a new system is happening. The spirit of God resided in a temple at one point, but now he's going to take up residence in, in the people's lives. In, in every single individual, the, this Holy Spirit is going to indwell and take up permanent residence in the believers and that the, we will be the temple of God's spirit. And we can begin to see this play out in many ways in chapters two, three, and four as, as the church becomes to come together and grow, explosive growth. And, and then they have this, they, they share their resources and they begin to share their acting like the temple should. You gotta pay to get in the temple over here. All you gotta do is show up and they'll share the resources here. This contrast of the old and the new is just being blasted at us in language that we, we wouldn't normally get, we wouldn't normally understand. And we would think at this time, man, this is amazing. I can't believe it. How did we get so different to the, our church now? And then we get to chapter five and then we get some, some things that we can identify with because hypocrisy shows up. See, the church would be awesome if people weren't in it. But people are in it. And the people show up, and, and as they do, just like us, we know we're not going to point any fingers here, but hypocrisy shows up. And in this hypocrisy, there's some, some judgment and some things that are going on. And then there's some, there's some criticalness um that comes from the people in the town, and they begin to persecute them. And then when you get to chapter 6, there's some, there's some growing pains, and there's some racial tension And then in chapter seven, that we have this persecution that really gets wild when we see the person of Stephen. And it's Stephen, he becomes, he gets so famous and becomes so hard to deal with that the people get just so ticked off that they end up killing the guy. And it, at the, at, at, when you get to the end of chapter seven, what you've seen is, is that they're in Jerusalem, but this, at the end of chapter seven, this persecution comes out and it's just like, bam! And, it, and all of the Christians begin to scatter because of this persecution. So you get over here and in chapters eight through 12, you see them go, go to Judea and Samaria. And now because of the persecution that happens here, God uses that in such a way where it moves the people out to spread the news of what God has done on their behalf. And in chapter eight, we saw Philip we had Tom Randall here last week introduce us to Philip and he begins to take the message of, of God's love to people that are different than him. And we see this, the, that, it, that it works there too, that God's promise of loving all of the people of the world. Nine, we get introduced to Saul. In fact, we get actually introduced to, to Saul a little bit earlier, right? at the very end of seven in the first of chapter eight, we see that Stephen gets killed and we've got this weird phrase. It says, and the people that threw the stones at Stephen laid their coats at the feet of Saul. Well, what do we care about that? I mean, what is that? Other than a foreshadowing of what's going to come again. And then chapter nine is about to, to show us some things. And by the time we get into chapter 13, which will be after Christmas, um, Saul becomes, it goes from being Peter being the, the main guy in the first half of the book to Paul being the main guy in the second half of the book. And then in 10 through 12, the message is going to go to the Gentiles. But in order for it to be received from the Jewish nation, it's got to go to the Gentiles by, from somebody they trust. And so Peter comes back on the scene after not hearing much from him for a while. It's been Stephen and then Philip and then Saul. Now Peter comes back on the scene and he meets with Cornelius. We'll talk about that next week. And we see the gospel go to the Gentiles. And what we see is when they receive the gospel, they have the, the tongues and the light and the fire, just like they did in chapter two. And it's affirmed to be the same, that God's message is for all people. And then the rest of the book will just continue to show us how that message goes out. So chapter nine. Let's take a look at it. Meanwhile, Saul was breathing out murderous threats 
against the Lord's disciples. Saul goes from this zealot that watches this execution in chapter 7 to by the time we get to the end of chapter 8, we, there's some time, it, re, it reads like it was just one week after another, but there have been some months, several months, possibly as many as a year goes on while Saul has become famous for his persecution of the church. It is, he is so angry that it says that he breathed out murderous threats. Every breath he took, he is a first century terrorist. He's a zealot for his religion and says anybody that doesn't understand the religion like I understand it deserves to be imprisoned and to die. And he gives all of his energies. We read in other passages of the scriptures that he gives all of his energies to trying to capture and to put into prison as many Christians as he can catch. He went to the high priest, verse two. I'm sorry, I'm not, where am I? What's, what's this is the verse? Oh yeah, verse two. And he asked him for letters to synagogues to Damascus. Now here's what's happening. I'm gonna show you a map. And Damascus is north of Jerusalem and north of Israel. It's in present day Syria. And it is, um, with all of the ancient roads, it is the key city for all roads that go north, south, and east, west. All of the Roman roads and the roads that were created even years before by other people, all of the roads even today still go through this area. It is the keystone. In fact, Damascus is the single oldest city continuously occupied in the world. And all travel east, west, and north and south will go there. Now watch, what's happened in Jerusalem is now the Christians are being persecuted and they're scattering and going out. And so Paul or Saul understands that everyone will go to Damascus to get away. They will go to Damascus and then they'll scatter east, west, and north. They're going to scatter. Almost everybody will go that way to try to get away. And so Saul is, is smart enough and so um, zealous enough for this that he says, give me letters, send me up to the synagogue in Damascus and let me go up there. Before they scatter in places, I'll never be able to find them. Let me put me, put me up in that city and as they come in, I'll just grab them. I'll just grab them, arrest them, and I'll bring them back down here. We'll put them in jail. It says that, uh, give me letters for Damascus so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. The road to Damascus would have looked something like this. This is the terrain for present-day Syria in this area. It's pretty desolate. You can see that there's not much going on there. The, the, the road would have looked something like that without the pavement. But about like that, and it's in this area that Saul has what we're going to read next. But before we moved on, Move on, I wanna say a little bit about Damascus. This is a picture of Damascus a little over five years ago. Yeah, it's not a desolate place, it's, but here's a picture of that city today. They have been in the middle of a five-year civil war where 400, over 470,000 people have been killed. 5,000 people are trying to flee out of that country every single day. Five million have left already. Six and a half million more remain in Syria, displaced from their homes, trying to get out. Now, I know that you've heard different reports and maybe formed different attitudes about the Syrian refugee crisis. Let me remind you that all of the first century Christians that fled the persecution in Jerusalem were Syrian refugees. 
they traveled up there and were displaced and scattered. Jesus himself was a refugee. I feel like we've got to rethink this, men and women. Now, I'm all for making sure we make that it, people that we allow into our country aren't members of ISIS. I'm not talking about being foolish. But out of fear, out of fear, we as a country have turned our backs on these people. I don't think Jesus is pleased. All I'm asking you to do is rethink it. It is a part of our story. It's a part of our heritage. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him and he fell at the ground and he heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And the religious expert, this, this religious zealot, doesn't even know who's talking to him. I mean, he knows it's somebody important because it's a voice. Uh, who are you, Lord? I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. First, it's interesting to note that Jesus is personally identified with the people Saul is throwing into jail. He is that close to you and I in our troubles. That when he intervenes, he intervenes in the first person pronoun. But it is also interesting that when Jesus responds to Saul, look how much time he spends reminding Saul of how bad a dude he is. He just simply says, get up. I'm Jesus. Get up. Go in the city. I got stuff for you to do. That's really not the way we parent. But there's no, there's no rebuke here of what he's been doing other than he's been persecuting him. There's no you know, reminders of the families in prison. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless and they heard the sound, but they did not see anyone. And so Saul got up from the ground and when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. And so they led him by the hand into Damascus for three days. He was blind and he did not eat, eat or drink anything. Who is this dude? Well, we know that Saul was born in Tarsus. Now, Tarsus means nothing to us, but I've got a quote from a Roman historian named Strabo that described Tarsus as having surpassed Athens and Alexandria. And he goes on to say, quote, any other place that can be named where there have been schools or lecturers or philosophies. Tarsus is an intellectual capital. It's so important that we have several historical figures, Caesar, Caesar um, and Mark Antony. Actually, you know the story you probably heard about when Cleopatra comes to her lover, Mark Antony, and she comes up the river in a big boat dressed as the goddess of love. She's traveling to Tarsus to find Mark Antony. And because of the role that Tarsus plays in the education of the Roman world, it is granted a special status, which means that anybody that's born and raised in Tarsus becomes full Roman. So Saul, being from Tarsus, is gigantically well-educated, exposed to the finest educational systems that the world had at that time. His father is wealthy. He's a Pharisee. He's, he's a leader in the Jewish community. And this guy is in the middle of it. Somewhere around probably age 10 or 12, he is shipped by his father to Jerusalem and he sits under the finest rabbi outside of Jesus, of Jesus's day. 
And in that time, he is educated to a point where he can argue the Old Testament scriptures. He can speak with people from the Greek culture. He knows Greek. He knows Hebrew. He knows Aramaic. He knows Latin. I mean, this, this guy's smart. And it's this guy that God says, I think I'll use you. Now it goes on to say, I want to read to you about his conversion because this is pretty cool. In Damascus, verse 10, there was a disciple named Ananias. This is the second Ananias of the book of Luke. I hope you remember Ananias, the first one. You know, he was the dude who lied about the offering. Here's another dude named Ananias of Damascus. And the Lord said, go to the house on, of Judas on Straight Street. Very particular instructions. Knows who owns the home, knows what street it's on. Make sure that Ananias doesn't have any excuses. And ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answers, uh, I have heard, perhaps you didn't, but I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done. That's the way we pray too. Like, Lord, in case you didn't know, um, the election went poorly. And um, I was wondering. So Ananias is praying and he says, uh, he's brought all kinds of harm to your saints in Jerusalem. And he comes here with the authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. Perhaps he's fooled you. Perhaps he's faking. The Lord said to Ananias, go. By the way, when you're asked to go and you come up with these kind of excuses and argue with God, when you go back, that's what he said, he, uh, go. Yeah, but go. Go, this man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and before the, before the people of Israel, and I will show him how much he must suffer. And Ananias goes, placing his hands on Saul. He says, uh, Brother Saul, buddy, friend, the Lord, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me to you so that you can see again and be filled with the Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again, and he got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus, and at once he began to preach. Now, that we're going to learn later on that it, it doesn't go that well for him initially. He's actually got about six or seven years he's going to spend in trading before he really gets after it. By the time we get into chapter 13 and he turns into Paul, he's going, to send, he's going to spend a lot of time getting instructed and being in his own desert experience. But for now, we can see just how amazing it is that God has decided to use this enemy of his church to be his primary sport, spokesperson for him, not only in that first century, but for the ages to come. Paul wrote more New Testament books than any other person. And who was better qualified? He could speak to the Jews in their heritage. He could speak to the Greeks in their philosophy. He was trained in both of their educational systems. What is amazing to me is that we see in Acts chapter 9 the testimony of Saul converting over. And then we see it in Acts 22 and in Acts 26. Now remember, Luke only has so much scroll. Right? He's only, he's only, he's only got so much space to record 30 plus years of church history from the time that Jesus ascends to the time right before Paul is arrested and killed. 
He's only got so much space. And he puts Saul's conversion three times. Now I thought, as you're reading it over, you would think, okay, well, it's probably in nine, we get the full version. And in 22, we get a different, shorter version. In 26, we get a really short version. You get the full Monty, the whole deal, the whole time, three times. And what it teaches us, one of the things, is that there's nothing as powerful as the story of your life. So I went through and I listened to these three different, and I read them and I noticed there's, that there are a few little things that are shared in ones that are not shared in others. But for the most part, you'll find that they are pretty much the same. And here's what they say. This is who I was. I was a zealot. I was a Pharisee. I was against the, the, the work of God. I tried to put as many people in prison as I could. I was educated. I was smarter than all of them. I knew they were wrong. This is what I did. I asked for letters and left my hometown and went all the way up to Damascus trying to find them before they scattered. I separated families and moved, removed children from their parents and husbands from their wives and put them in destitute prisons where they starved to death and were killed. This is what God said or did. A light came upon me and said, dude, what are you doing? And I said, who are you? He said, I'm Jesus. When you persecute my people, you're persecuting me. And then he says, this is how I've changed. I was lost. Now I'm found. I was blind, literally. And now I see. I was a stranger to the gospel. And now I'm its chief proponent of it. I'm, I'm, I'm resisting the cause of Christ. And now I'm doing all I can to increase it and move it forward. This is who I was. This is what I did. This is what God said and did. And this is how I changed. Now, it's my conviction that everybody here can remember that outline. It's who I was, what I did, what God said and did. It's how I changed. And some of you in the room, you have amazing stories. You have just phenomenal stories. Mine's not like amazing, but mine's pretty good. I was unsupervised. I was a, my mom, I was a godless home. My mom worked nights. I grew up in government housing. No one had ever graduated from high school or college. I ended up getting there. And I, had, I could do one thing. I could do one thing when I was a teenager. I could run fast and talk fast. And so I got in a lot of trouble. And coaches noticed me. And then Jesus came into my life. And he took this arrogant, insecure, redheaded, I know, see how much I've changed? <laughs> redheaded, godless user of everyone. And by his love redeemed me. Changed my life. Changed the trajectory of my life. I've never been the same. I, I still can't get over it. Some of you have got those kinds of stories. You've got, you've got those kinds of stories of transformation. And they are so beautiful and so amazing that for you not to have them in those four things, this is who I was, this is what I did, this is what God did, and this is how I changed. For you not to have them in several versions. You should have a two-minute version that you got to do because the, you're in a hurry and the people's gonna, about to get off. The, the bus or something. You should have a, like a five minute version that you can give a little bit longer at the water cooler on break. And there should be a 30 minute version that you can do where you kind of go into some of the particulars. There should be versions in your life that you've got, but the rest of you are sitting there going, uh, I ain't got one of those. And just for fun, this is fun. And we'll, we'll do, and do this and all, everybody that's watching at the Saratoga campus here and at South Hills, because I'm live for the first time at Sunnyvale tomorrow. So let's do this. Let's do this here. Just for how many people in the room think, I got a pretty good story. My, God did some pretty cool stuff in my life. I was, you know, it's pretty cool. Come on, get it. Okay, good. Raise your hands if you're watching it on video. Okay, good. Now, how many people in the room 
think mine is pretty boring. Okay, as many or more. How about y'all that didn't raise your hands? Is yours kind of in the middle? Or is it so boring you didn't even want to raise it? <laughs> a lot of us think that whatever our story is, it's not very useful because we're, we're so used to it, we're so close to it, we don't think it's really that important. Now watch this. It has been my experience throughout the years that most people think they don't have a very good story. And they are wildly entertained when they hear a really great story, but they don't identify with it. They just laugh at it and wonder at it and sit there and go, wow, I wish I had that kind of story. What kind of story do you think is really going to grip them? It's in a trick question. It's a story that's like theirs, that they can identify with. A person who comes from a single parent home can identify with mine. Somebody who is trying to parent in a single parent home now, they can identify with that one. Somebody who's both families, both, both uh, parents are trying to do or have jobs because the, the pressure of trying to pay a mortgage in this area, you can identify with those testimonies. Somebody who's had trouble finding a job, you can identify with that. Somebody who's, who's really upset about the election, you can probably identify with that. So you, you've got all of these things. People want to hear your stories. There's no story that can't be used by God. And so what I'm trying to do here is say, for those of us who have really great stories, you should have that story ready. And for those of you who have stories that you classify as not that great, and some of you say actually lousy, they should be ready. Nothing's as powerful as your story. Nothing. It's so powerful that the strongest atheist, the most educated atheist in the world, cannot argue against it. He cannot. He can, he can not like it. He can, he can say, I just don't, I don't believe it. But he can't argue it. You, you can't say, you know, I grew up in, the, in this small town. He can't say, no, you didn't. <laughs> it's your story. It's one of the most powerful things about you. It's so powerful that Saul's is, is shared with us three times. We don't need it three times. We get it. Wait till you get start reading. Next, when you start reading the second half of the book each week, like you're doing now, reading chapters 1 through 12 every week. Well, after Christmas, we're going to read chapters chapter 13 through 28. We'll probably break it up a little bit. But when we get to 22 and 26, you're going to go, I, I think I just read this. There's nothing as powerful. So let me close with this. The story of Saul teaches us something really amazing. There is no past that disqualifies you. There's no past. And no matter how bad you were, no matter how long it took you to embrace the grace, no matter how many times you've returned back to, back to things that you've gone back to, there's no place you can go that God can't use and redeem and glorify himself in it. There's no person excluded. No past disqualifies, no person excluded. Your story's that powerful. What Jesus wants to do through you is that amazing. Every one of you. And just a closing thought. If God could birth his church through a group of uneducated cowards and then place the completion of the mission, taking the mission to the Gentiles of the world in the hands of Saul the murderer, might he possibly get something done by the elected officials of our country? He is not hampered, confused, or hindered in his work by who gets elected. Don't ever let God be that small in your mind. Let's pray.
God, thank you for the stories that we have and the grace that you continue to pour out towards us, the mercy that we have received by your grace. Thank you that we were, though we were your enemies, we were not disqualified, we were not excluded. We ask that you would give us the courage and the faith to live as your people in a way that brings you pleasure and glory. In Jesus' name, amen.